اللہ وسلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علی وصاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اردو اللہ صب رب کا بلکمہ والمحدد الحسن وجاد البلت حسن رب شلی صدری و اسلی عمری وحل العقد تملسان یف کو کولی میرے اسپیشل ایلڈرز اینڈ میرے بردر اینڈ سسٹرز آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود اسلامی گریٹنگز السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میں پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگز آف اللہ سبحانہ و تعالیٰ بی آن آل آف یو الحمد للہ اٹ از این آنر اینڈ اے پلیشر فار می ٹو بی انوائٹیڈ فار دا تھرڈ ٹائم بائی دا دبئی انٹرنیشنل ہولی قرآن اوارڈ آرگنائز بائی دا دبئی گورمنٹ اینڈ دا پیٹرنیج آف شیخ محمد راشد المختوم دا وائس پریسیڈنٹ اینڈ پرائم منسٹر آف یو اے اینڈ دا رول آف دبئی تو دیز لیکچر از مس کنسیپشن از باٹ اسلام اٹ از دا ڈیوٹی آف ایوری مسلم ٹو کنوے دا میسج آف اسلام ٹو دوز ہو آر ناٹ اویئر آف اٹ اٹس کمپلسری فار ایوری مسلم ٹو ڈو داوا داوا مینس این انویٹیشن اے کال ٹو دا نان مسلمس اٹ از دا ڈیوٹی آف ایوری مسلم دیٹ ہی انوائٹس دا نان مسلمس ٹوڈ اسلام there are various different methodologies as well as strategies used by muslims as far as dawah is concerned the most common strategy is whenever a muslim meets a non muslim he speaks 100 good things about islam even if that non muslim agrees with all the hundred good things that the person has spoken about Islam, yet that non-Muslim will have few negative points behind the mind. He may say, yes, I agree about all these hundred good things about Islam, but you are the same Muslim who is a terrorist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who is a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the same people who spread religion with the sword. You are the people who subjugated the women. Ah, you are the Muslims who marry more than one woman. These few negative points at the back of his mind will prevent him from accepting the beauty of Islam. That's the reason. Whenever I meet any non-Muslim, I ask him up front, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable that he can criticize Islam, If he wants to can attack Islam, I make him comfortable and I ask him, what does he feel is wrong with the religion of Islam? And after he's made comfortable, he poses about three or four questions about Islam. And in the past couple of decades that I've been in the field of Dawah, I have realized that there are about 20 most common questions which the non-Muslims have regarding Islam. When the non-Muslim poses three or four questions about Islam, invariably, these three or four questions fall amongst the 20 most common questions. If all the Muslims know the reply to these 20 common questions posed by the non-Muslims with reason, logic, and science, with the quotation from Quran and Sahih Hadith, and the quotation of the scripture of the non-Muslim, even if he cannot make the non-Muslim accept Islam, at least he can neutralize the animosity that is there in the minds of the non-Muslims. At least he can neutralize the negative feeling that the person has regarding Islam. That's the reason it's very important that we Muslims are aware about these 20 common questions. How do these 20 common questions arise in the minds of the non-Muslims? Every day, the non-Muslims, they are being bombarded by the international media regarding misinformation about Islam. There is virulent propaganda regarding Islam in the international media. Whether you read the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the television satellite channels, the internet, we find there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. And depending 
how the media portrays Islam, these 20 common questions, they keep on changing. The 20 common questions that were there a couple of decades earlier, they were different than what they are today. The 20 common questions a couple of decades later may change again. Depending upon how the media portrays Islam, similarly, the 20 common questions keep on changing in the minds of the non-Muslims. And believe me, by Allah's grace, I have traveled to most of the major countries in the world. USA, Canada, UK, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Malaysia, South Africa, India. Wherever you travel, these 20 common questions are the same. There may be an additional one or two questions depending upon the local surrounding and the environment of that place. For example, if you go in the Western countries, there may be an additional question. Why does Islam prohibit the taking and giving of interest? But the remaining 20 common questions are the same. If every Muslim masters the reply to these 20 common questions, he will be able to do the fard, the compulsory act of da'wah to the non-Muslims. When you appear for an examination, if you at least want to pass with a good grade, not excellent, at least good grade. What you do, you read the guide. You know, in India, we have the Naunit 21 most likely questions. If you want to appear and pass favorably well, then you study the most common questions. In India, we have Naunit 21 most likely questions to appear in the examination. In every country, you have such books that if you want to do a shortcut and at least pass as far as the exam is concerned, Similarly, these 20 common questions will at least make you a part-time die. If it cannot make the non-Muslim accept Islam, it will at least remove the animosity that is there in the mind of the non-Muslim. Time may not permit me to cover all the 20 questions in this time due to the limited time that I have. You can surely go on the internet on our website, www.irf.net, where all the answers are given in detail. There may be certain non-Muslims who may go out of the way and read material against Islam. For example, they may go to the anti-Islamic sites. They may read books which are written against Islam. As far as these non-Muslims are concerned, who go out of the way to find additional material against Islam. For that, we have another 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims who have gone to anti-Islamic sites and have read material against Islam. That we won't discuss today. That is, if you want to get, you know, maybe first class or distinction, you have to do that. The reply to these 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims who go to anti-Islamic sites is also given on our website, www.irf.net. As far as today is concerned, I will try and cover the major questions, the first, more than 50% at least, of the 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims regarding Islam. The first number one misconception regarding Islam, the top of the charts, is regarding Jihad. Today, Jihad is the most misunderstood word regarding Islam. It is not only misunderstood by the non-Muslims, it is even misunderstood by many of us Muslims. Non-Muslims and main Muslims think that jihad means any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for power, whether it be for wealth, whether it be for land, whether it be for language, any war fought by any Muslim for any reason is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for money, whether it be for power, whether it be for land, whether it be for language. Jihad is an Arabic word which comes from the word jahada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. In the Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclinations. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. 
Jihad also means to fight against oppression. Jihad also means to fight in self-defense in the battlefield. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student is striving and struggling to pass in the examination, in Arabic, we say the student is doing jihad, he's striving and struggling. Many people have a misconception and they think that jihad can only be done by a Muslim. There are many verses in the Quran which say that even non-Muslim did jihad. Quran says in Surah Luqman chapter number 31 verse number 14, they have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail the mother bore you and in pain did she give you birth. Immediately after praising the parents, especially the mother, the verse continues. Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 15 says that, but if your parents do jihad, strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, besides Almighty God, of whom you have no knowledge, then don't obey them. But yet, live with them with love and companionship. Here the Quran is talking about non-Muslim parents doing jihad, striving and struggling to make their children do shirk. Worship somebody else besides Allah. A similar message is given in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 8, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. But if their parents do jihad, they strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, besides Almighty God, then don't obey them. So here the Quran is talking about non-Muslim parents doing jihad. And there are various such examples of Quran mentioning non-Muslims doing jihad. So this type of jihad, in Arabic, we say jihad fi sabil shaitan. Jihad in the way of the Satan. What we Muslims should do is jihad fi sabilillah, jihad in the way of Allah. And whenever the word is mentioned individually about jihad, in the Islamic context, it is understood it is jihad fi sabilillah. Most of the non-Muslims, including many so-called Muslim scholars, inverted commas, they translate jihad as the holy war. Holy war, if you translate in Arabic, it means harbu muqaddasa. If you read the Quran, if you read the Hadith, there is no Quranic verse, there is no Hadith which uses the word harbu muqaddasa. The word holy war doesn't exist in the Quran, neither in the Hadith. Jihad, as I mentioned, basically means to strive and struggle. And one type of jihad is also fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is kital in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But jihad doesn't basically mean a war. One type of jihad, there are various jihad for nafs, one type of jihad is fighting in self-defense in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we see the history of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the first 13 years of his prophethood that he lived in Makkah, there were many Quranic verses that were revealed, all the Makkan surahs. Many a time in these verses the word jihad was used and never did the Muslims ever fight, physically fight. Only when they migrated to Medina, then the wars took place. But yet you find the word jihad in several verses of the Quran which were revealed in Makkah. Many examples I can give you. For example, the Quran says in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, that those who do jihad in the way of Allah, those who strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we open up the pathways for them. When the verse was revealed, there was no war at that time. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 52, that do not follow the unbelievers, but do jihad against them, strive against them strenuously with the Quran. That means you do jihad with the Quran. Jihad with the Quran means strive to convey the message of Allah. Do you think you're going to fight with the Quran? So here we realize that this misconception regarding the word jihad, it is depending how the media portrays this word jihad 
wasn't a problem a couple of decades earlier. After 9-11, it came on top of the charts, number one. Previously, it wasn't there. So depending on the media portrays Islam, these misconceptions arise in the minds of the non-Muslims. For more details on jihad, you can see my lecture, my talk, Terrorism and Jihad and Islamic Perspective. The second most common question today, according to me, that is there in the minds of non-Muslims is that Muslims are fundamentalist. And many a time, we Muslims feel ashamed and we don't know how to reply. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a mathematician wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person who wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. If we have a fundamentalist robber in the society, whose profession is to rob, he's a bane for the society. On the other hand, if we have a fundamentalist doctor, whose profession is to save thousands of human lives, he's good for the society. So depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. <laughs> because I know, follow, and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be a few fundamentals which the non-Muslims may think it is against humanity, but the moment you reply to them or tell them the logical reason why these things are in Islam, there is not a single human being who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. When we go back in history, we come to know that according to the Western dictionary, Fundamentalism was first time used to describe a group of American Christians in the early part of the 20th century. These American Christians, they protested against the church and they said, previously the church believed that the complete message of the Bible was from God. These protestant Christians, they protested against the church and said, not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every letter, every word of the Bible is from Almighty God, then this movement is a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that every word, every letter of the Bible is not from Almighty God, then this movement is not a good movement. When we read the Oxford Dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient or fundamental doctrines of any religion. But when we read the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there's a slight change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient scriptures or fundamentals of any religion, especially Islam. Especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, immediately you start thinking of a Muslim. The Muslims, they're fundamentalists, they're extremists. And we Muslims, we are becoming apologetic. No, 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 I'm not a fundamentalist. No, no, I'm not an extremist. I say, I am an extremist. I'm extremely honest. I'm extremely just, I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely loving. <laughs> Can anyone tell me why being extremely just, extremely honest, extremely loving, extremely merciful, extremely kind is bad? What's wrong in being an extremist? The Quran says you have to be extremely honest. 
You can't be partly honest when benefits you, you're honest. When doesn't benefit you, you're dishonest. The Quran says you have to be extremely honest, extremely just. So if you are a practicing Muslim, you have to be extremely kind, extremely honest, extremely just. We have to be extremist in the correct direction. We should not be extremist in the wrong direction. But a Muslim should be extremist in following the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 28, Allah says, Udkhlu fi silmi kaffa. Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. You can't say partly. So why are the Muslims becoming apologetic? The media is attacking Islam and unfortunately, we Muslims, we have the best deen. But why are we afraid? Why are we apologetic? It's time that we turn the tables over. The third most common misconception is Muslims are terrorists. And after 9-11, you had the 7th July, that's the London bombing, and there was a common statement which said, all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. And it was very common on the media, and that gave rise to a new lecture of mine, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? Time does not permit me to speak in detail about is terrorism a Muslim monopoly, but you're most welcome to see on the Peace TV or on a website. We know from the media that many a time, two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity. For example, more than 60 years back, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. These people, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But we common Indians, we call these people as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you have to call these people as patriots, you have to call these people as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. And I very often attend the media, and while having interaction with the Indian press, I ask them a question, that do you consider Bhagat Singh as a terrorist? He said, no. I said, why? The same Western media, when they call Bhagat Singh as a terrorist, you say, no, he's not a terrorist. Why? Because you know the background of the history of India freedom. Even I consider Bhagat Singh as not to be a terrorist. But the same Western media, today, when they call Muslims, they say, why do you agree? Have you done a research? They try to laugh. Quran says in Surah Ujurah, chapter 49, verse number 6, whenever you get information, you check it up before you pass to the third person. The point to be noted is that when the British government called Bhagat Singh a terrorist, you didn't agree. Now why do you agree with them? Why these double standards? And you have several such examples. When we read the history of the American Revolution, in 1775, during the American Revolution, George Washington, he was called as the terrorist number one by the British government, when the British was ruling America. The British has called George Washington as terrorist number one. Later on, when America gets its freedom, George Washington is made the president of USA. Imagine, terrorist number one becomes the president of USA. And he happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come, including George Bush. And you find several such examples, several. You have the example of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, several decades earlier, when South Africa was ruled by the white apartheid government, Nelson Mandela was arrested and was imprisoned in Robben Islands for more than 25 years. 
by the white apartheid government, Nelson Mandela was called as terrorist number one. Later on, when South Africa gets its freedom and the white apartheid government is removed, Nelson Mandela is given freedom and he gets the Nobel Prize for peace. Imagine terrorist number one of the world gets the Nobel Prize for peace. Not that he was bad and he became good. For the same activity for what he was called a terrorist, 30 years later, he gets the Nobel Prize for the same activity, Nobel Prize for peace. So we realize whoever is in power, whatever label that person gives, that gets stuck on to that person. This is media. Media is very powerful. According to me, it is the most important weapon today. It can convert black into white, day into night, hero into a villain, villain into a hero. This is media. Unfortunately, we Muslims, we are very backward as far as media is concerned. Our technology, you know, whatever technology is halal, what is permitted in Quran and Sunnah, we have to use it. We have to convert it to halal. Television per se is not haram. I do agree, 99% things that come on television is haram. We have to convert the haram into halal. And that's how we have to convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best way today that you can convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the satellite channel. It is the media. At least we can give shahada, we can tell on the day of judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least we tried our level best to let the message of Islam reach every home. Or at least as many homes as possible. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, then three and a half years after the launch of Peace TV, now the viewership of Peace TV is more than 100 million. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> People may be wondering that, you know, why are there so many cameras? People are saying, why 12 cameras required? One lecture, one man, 12 cameras. One man and 12 cameras. The television channel says, oh, we only use two or three cameras. 12 cameras because we want to present Islam in a beautiful manner. When you have rock show, that time 12 cameras, no problem. When Dai gives a lecture, we have only two cameras. <laughs> See, today is the age of science and technology. When we want to convince the youngsters, the media is taking them on the wrong track. We have to use the same media to get our youngster on the right track. From wrong track to the right track. And believe me, we know, I agree, that majority of the media is haram. But as long as we don't break any rule of the Sharia, of the Quran and Sahih Hadith, we can use this media to the benefit of the spread of Islam. The fourth most common misconception in the minds of the non-Muslim is Islam was spread by the sword. What is the meaning of the word Islam? Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word silm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. So if I translate, Islam was spread by the sword, it means peace was spread by the sword. It's contradictory. How can peace be spread by the sword? And we know that every human being in the world would not want peace to prevail. Islam is a religion of peace. Its main aim and objective is to spread peace. But every human being in this world would not want peace to prevail. That's the reason every country in the world has a police force. This police force many a time uses force to maintain peace in that country. They don't use force to disrupt peace. If the anti-social elements want to disrupt peace, the police of the various countries, they use force to maintain peace in that country. Similarly, in Islam, Islam is against violence. It's against fighting. It's against using force, except as a last resort to maintain peace. Similarly, Islam does give permission to use force to let justice and peace prevail in that land. And the best reply to this allegation 
that Islam was spread by the sword is given very well by a very famous historian by the name of Delisi O'Leary in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number eight. History makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. I will repeat his statement. Delisi O'Leary says in the book Islam at the Crossroad, page number eight, that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. Which sword? We Muslims, we ruled Spain for 800 years. We didn't do the job. We didn't convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. Later on, the Crusaders came, the Christians came, and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the azan. If you read history, the religion that was spread by force was the religion of Christianity. If you read history, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in the name of Christianity. And today, the same people are telling that Islam was spread by the sword. We Muslims, we have been the rulers of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the Britishers came, for a few years the French came, but as a whole, the Muslims have been the rulers of the Arab land for the past 14 years. Yet today, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means the Christians in generation. These 14 million Coptic Christians, they are giving Shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam wasn't spread by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India for more than a thousand years. If we wanted, we could have converted each and every Indian at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. Today, more than 80% of the Indians are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada. They are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. Today, the country which has the maximum number of Muslims, it is Indonesia. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia? Malaysia has more than 50% Muslims. Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? The reply is given by Thomas Carlyle, a very famous historian from Europe. He writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, and he places Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his hero. And he writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, that which sword? First, you have to find your sword. Which sword? First, you have to find your sword. Every new idea originates in the mind of one. In one man's head, it dwells alone. One man against the whole world. It will do little good that he picks up a sword and propagates it. You have to find your sword. He's talking about the sword of intellect. Which sword has made hundreds and thousands of human beings to accept Islam? He's talking about the sword of intellect. And I started my talk by quoting a verse of the glorious Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. He says, Udu hasna, wajadun asan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. It is the sword of reason, logic, which is conquering the hearts of the people. It's not the sword of metal. Even if we had the sword of steel, we could not use it. Because Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, like Rahafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. But truth stands out clear from error. Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sword of intellect, the sword of reasoning, 